So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Marta Hartman. Um, Marta is a lecturer in the Department of Agricultural Education and Communication, and this is the second Global Education Lab seminar of the semester. And we started this seminar series as an opportunity for students and faculty and staff to get together and learn about global education projects, uh, international development projects, and just agricultural resources or, or agricultural issues around the world. And so we're I'm very pleased to have Dr. Hartman here to share about the Women's Leadership Program in Paraguay. And she will give us lots of information. And, and we want this to be interactive. And so very mm -hmm. soon, Marta will ask for questions mm -hmm. and take questions. So thank you, Marta. Thank you very much, Grady. And good afternoon, everyone. I see quite a few familiar faces. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your interest in learning about the project that we have in, in Paraguay. And as Grady mentioned, uh, this is a very informal session. Uh, we prefer that you ask questions as they, you generate them. Um, and uh, any comments, also any observations, any suggestions will be welcome. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. I know we have about 55 minutes, right, Grady? Okay. So women's leadership in Paraguay. Um, to, I need to give you some background before starting to speak about the project in Paraguay. Because the project in Paraguay is one of five projects, or five components of a global uh, program. The global program is USAID, the US Agency for International Development uh, Initiative, a global initiative that came about uh, from a, uh, Hillary Clinton, if, when, if you recall not too long ago when she was uh, the Secretary of State, she traveled, and I understand she traveled to many more countries than the, her predecessors. And she witnesses and she learned of the condition of women uh, around the world. So she asked uh, the federal government to provide some uh, financial allocation to create this global program. The program, as uh, it is stated here, uh, takes place in four different countries. Okay? Uh, Paraguay is just one of them and the only one in Latin America. Then South Sudan and Rwanda in Africa and Armenia. I also have to mention that Rwanda actually uh, has two projects. All five uh, of these projects, sorry, four of these projects deal directly with the agricultural sector. Um, the second project in Rwanda is targeted to the educational system of the country. So uh, last year, um, close to 9 million donors were applicated uh, to undertake this initiative. Okay, the purpose to promote local and national development goals by promoting and developing curricula and opportunities to all, but particularly to women. Okay, and the USAID, it just happened that also last year they finalized their new policy on gender equality and female empowerment. Uh, by the way, that is, if you just Google uh, USAID um, or Gender Equality and Female Employment Policy, USAID is accessible to everyone who wishes to uh, review that policy or familiarize yourself with that policy. The WLP, the Worldwide Women Leadership Program, has three objectives, as you see them. So it works, um, the way it operates is through a uh, institution, a university, or a group of universities here in the United States, and an institution or institutions in the in the in countries in Rwanda, Paraguay, and so forth, and so, uh, so on and so forth. 
Okay. And um, so this project is also uh, aimed at building the capacity of the institution, of the local institutions. And, and most of these institutions, sometimes all of the institutions in country are education, um, educational institutions. And uh, the leadership and empower, uh, empowerment of women is the focus of the project. Developing the leadership, uh, not only in terms of a personal, at a personal level, but also the prof at the professional level of women, females, uh, girls, and young ladies, women. But why? Anyway, so let's talk more specifically about our our project or program in Paraguay. As you know, Paraguay is a country in South America. It's uh, one of the only two um, countries without a coast uh, uh, to the Pacific or to the Atlantic. Um, with a population of close to 7 million, uh, that's probably a very conservative um, number and that dates back to 2010. So by now we say it is probably reaching 10 million inhabitants. The GDP per capita is 5,000 close to 300 US dollars. Now the uh, upper 20 percent of the population, they uh, they hold 62. 0.4% of all income. And the poorest 60% only enjoy 20% of national income. So as you see, there's a significantly uh, more gap between the poor and the rich, or the very rich and the very poor, I should say. Agriculture uh, 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 is the basis for the economy of Paraguay. It employs uh, about 30% of the population. Okay. Now, let's talk about women and men. The gap that I, uh, I mentioned uh, um, consists of the fact that women represent about 50% of the labor force. Their salaries, however, uh, they, they are considered the second lowest in Latin America and therefore one of the lowest uh, globally. 18.2% of economically active women are farmers or considered farmers. However, there are many women who do f a farming, but they're not considered farmers. Uh, so the number of women working and the fields and agriculture um, and the um, food uh, production area is higher than that 18%. Now, men with 16 years of education earn an, uh, on average 26.7% of their female counterparts. So it's even the gap in terms of uh, salaries between the two sexes is even higher than here. I think here uh, we females earn about 70% uh, of, um, sorry, yeah, it's uh, 70 cents for every dollar earned by a man. Susana, is that what you did? Yeah, between seven and eight, not seven and eight. Between seven and eight mm -hmm. uh, for every dollar that a man uh, earns, on the average. Uh, of course, as you see in Paraguay, the gap is much wider. And um, while men, or three-fourths of men are economically active, only one-half of them are, of women are. Any questions or comments? Okay. The Women's Leadership Program in Paraguay consists of a partnership 
between this institution, the University of Florida, and specifically the IFAS, the Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, and the National University of Asunción, or, Nas or Universidad Nacional de Asunción, and uh, specifically with their um, college or school of uh, agrarian sciences. Okay. The main purpose is to support national and local development goals to promote gender equality and female empowerment. And our project or partnership consists on uh, three specific objectives. One, as you see, uh, deals with the access of females to uh, institutions of higher learning. Uh, particularly, of course, to uh, access to the National University, their uh, School of Agrarian Sciences. It also um, deals with the, uh, with the uh, institutional capacity of the School of Agrarian Sciences at the National University. And, and uh, objective two also. Uh, uh, we include the development of or implementation of leadership uh, development uh, curriculum integrated in the curriculum as well as a gender perspective in uh, included in that in their uh, curriculum. And objective three, uh, as you know these days in the current world, um, you have to create, you have to develop, you have to cultivate partnerships and linkages and alliances and collaborations to be able to achieve your goals, the goals, the ins your institutional or organizational goals. So this uh, last objective uh, addresses uh, the need of um, identifying in partnering with entities in Paraguay. So to give you an idea of the type of linkages of, um, of collaborators, partnership that we have developed, um, this is a list of them. Um, we have here uh, governmental as well as non-governmental organizations. We have some regional, meaning uh, within Latin America, organizations. We have institutions of learning, like the uh, agricultural um, education high schools. We are four uh, that are partnering with us, and they're located in different parts of the country, in the cities of Berlin, um, Baracayu, and this is a very, uh, all of them are, are, are very interesting, but Baracayu to me has a special interest because that's an all-girls school and is located in a, a nationally uh, protected area, a beautiful reserve in the east part of the country. Uh, in San Pedro. ICA, I don't know if you're familiar, you guys are familiar with Instituto Interamericano de Cooperación para la Agricultura? Some of you, um, I see. Austin said, yeah, of course. ICA. Um, ICA is an uh, Inter American uh, Corporation for Agriculture. They're present in all. If not all, maybe in most Latin American countries. Um, in Paraguay, they just happen to have their, um, their office, the headquarters, and within the campus of the university. And they have been of, uh, they have become one of the, our key collaborators. Um, they have uh, extensive experience. In fact, the director of ICA in Paraguay has had extensive exten um, experience working in leadership development and, uh, throughout Latin America. And they're extremely supportive of our project. Um, you probably know that USAID has what they call missions. 
these are the units uh, in different parts around the world. So in Paraguay, there is a USAID mission, and we work very closely uh, with them. Uh, we have uh, two NGOs, uh, the Fundación Paraguaya and Fundación Moisés Bertoni. And uh, we also work with a corporation, a huge corporation, it's called Itaipu. They are the uh, binational Paraguay Brazil hydroelectric power plant. They provide like 75% of the electricity in, in the country in Paraguay. Um, two ministers, the Ministry of Women, yes, Paraguay uh, is one of those countries with a Ministry of Women. I wish we had, we could say that of our country. Um, it recently um, uh, opened, I think it was, uh, when was that, Sonia? I was maybe three, four years ago. It used to be a secretary under uh, the president's office, but now it's a, a ministry a, uh, at the national level. And of course, the Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock, we, uh, some of you might know that Atibuca, an NGO, an international NGO, they work all over the world. Uh, mm, we're very proud of um, having FECOPROD, which is the National Federation of Cooperatives of um, producers, okay, small and medium producers. They are all over the country. They have a very strong uh, presence, and uh, they are highly respected too. Ika uh, Maracayu, and also I'm a member of Relacer, which is the the network of uh, Latin American uh, Extension and Rural Services. So I have engaged well, I said, uh, as a collaborator in our women's leadership uh, project or program. Any questions or comments? Initiative. Our project um, consists of 11 specific objectives. Uh, I'm sorry, initiatives. Of course, the each uh, objective, each of the 11 objectives are uh, closely uh, tied to one or more uh, of the three objectives. And the initiatives are um, also, they uh, go hand in hand with the indicators uh, that the U.S. Agency for International Development or USAID provided to us. So the USAID is the funding agency. Okay? They are the ones that provide us with the money. However, the, that money and the management of the program at, uh, at that level, at the global level, uh, level is um, done by HED. The, it's an agency, the agency um, for higher education for development. Uh, they, their headquarters is in Washington, D.C., and they are in the business of managing quite a few of the USAID-funded projects around the world. So we have two bosses on top of us. Uh, that uh, has represented a, a bit of a challenge in state number one. Uh, because sometimes, uh, uh, and, and this is not unique to this project, in many projects that is the case, and as I'm sure you're able to understand, uh, that creates a bit of complication, or it, it can create a bit of complications, and you have to make sure that you keep both of these parties uh, happy, informed, uh, sometimes uh, you receive different messages and, and it's sometimes you have to work a very thin line between these two entities. But that's the nature of, of the business. So they do have, USAID has uh, indicators. In other words, they, they uh, have a specific uh, initiatives that they uh, stipulated for us 
uh, to reach. They also, the HED also have uh, their own indicators, and of course, we have our own indicators and targets. So there are targets for each of these indicators, all three group of indicators. Okay. Uh, oh, by the way, I, I don't think I mentioned that this is a three-year uh, pro project, and we just, uh, uh, what is today is the six, six days ago, uh, we've completed our first year of existence. So we just beginning the first quarter of the second year. Right. <laughs> I have to say that uh, a few of the um, of the WLP, the project team uh, members are here, and some of you have also contributed to, in the project. Uh, I also have a friend here who did work in Paraguay just before we got there, right, Natalia? Natalia, you were, you, in fact, you were with Agni Boca, exactly. And you Yes, and you uh, told Agni Boca so many good things about UF and us, that so when I, we arrived there, they had these huge expectations about UF. <laughs> Um, but they are really our friends. So the uh, initiatives, of course, um, the uh, incorporation of gender in the curriculum. Okay, how are we uh, doing that? How are we trying to uh, undertake this initiative? Well, <laughs> that took a bit of a, a strategic planning and implementation. Uh, because as in most places, uh, gender is something to, that is not well understood what gender is or gender issues or a gender perspective. They are mostly stereotypes and misconceptions and ignorance really about what constitutes gender and the value of gender. What, how, or, or the role of gender in, uh, in the uh, in regional and natural development goals. Okay, so and even in an institution of higher uh, learning, that is a challenge to talk, to even discuss, to even bring to the table gender and gender issues. So we began uh, by developing a course um, for uh, on gender issues. That took a, a lot of input from um, all the members in, at the, at the uh, university and the College of Agricultural Sciences, and that's the way we want it, because our approach is very participatory in nature. Okay, with, um, and, and, and along with that, it's very participatory. We also have uh, uh, a philosophy that underlines the importance or the uh, or how essential it is to build that uh, sustainability of the program because. The last thing that we want is that in you know three years or so at the end of the project to everything uh, come down as I personally have witnessed in different parts of the world. Uh, we want these uh, initiatives to be part of what they do and the way they operate at the, univer at the National University of, um, of uh, Asuncion. So uh, the court, we were very, um, I think a bit of luck always help uh, because we happened to be at, the, at a point when the curriculum of the entire college was being reviewed in a new one. Uh, the seven year, every seven years they go through the process of reviewing the curriculum and revising the curriculum. So we timed it, and, it, and I have to confess it was not planned like that, but it just happened like that beautifully. Uh, that um, it happened that we, we were on time to request approval, development and approval of the, of the course, and it was approved uh, by the faculty, uh, by the college, and by the uh, university. 
in uh, next, the next step in, in terms of that initiative is to uh, work with each of the five uh, departments within the college. Okay, they have five academic units within the uh, college. So we are targeting each of these, uh, of these departments uh, separately and based on the particular needs and the particular um, composition and of the of the department, we are integrating EME uh, global. Sorry, a gender perspective and specific or, or, or an, an, a number of identified courses. Okay, so that's uh, where we are right now. Uh, a great deal of work, a great deal of resources in terms of work and time and efforts. Questions? And, and yeah. what level is the, are you incorporating um, gender issues into the curriculum? Is that, you mentioned that there were high schools that oh, okay. focused on agriculture. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I did not um, make it clear that this is at the university in the curriculum of the, the College of Agricultural Sciences. Um, but we are working in terms of the four schools, uh, agricultural high schools where we're working at. And by the way, we uh, plans are underway to work with other agricultural high schools during the country. But um, in that school, we are uh, incorporating gender and uh, our uh, leadership development uh, workshops or training program that takes place at the uh, high school. Yeah. Everyone, <laughs> administrators, faculty, staff, students, Collaborators. Sometimes uh, these sessions, these efforts are targeted only to members of the college. Sometimes uh, we open the doors to, uh, the, to representatives from any of those organizations that are collaborating with us or anybody else who wishes to participate. Okay, so that's for them to sell the gender case, right? Sorry? The, those trainings are for them to see the importance of... Oh, yes. So yes. Like well, not only, it, we begin by, by uh, defining what gender is. Okay. All the way to, you know, key concepts, all the way to um, exa giving um, specific examples on how to incorporate a gender perspective and, uh, and subjects like uh, plant pathology or soil sciences uh, to the importance of uh, doing gender mainstreaming to the importance of developing a policy to deal with gender issues. Okay. One more, sorry. No, that's okay, Natalia. What are the, uh, the classes that you started at the university? In the okay, they approve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when they approve, my question is again, um, is it gender in agriculture or is it gender in society, gender 101? Like, yeah, the, the course is entitled Gen uh, Genero y Interculturalismo, Gender and Interculturalism. That was a decision of the faculty to label it like that. Now, the content of the course, uh, was uh, developed by, it was a collaborative effort uh, from the project and uh, the uh, faculty, as well as uh, input that was provided by Adivoca, Amelia Moro, uh, the gender specialist, as well as uh, the Ministry for Women. So we went outside to external uh, stakeholders to um, develop the curriculum of that for that course. Good, great questions. Oh, speaking of policies, right there. So in development, as you will know, you have. 
have to engage in the development or, or modification of policies. You have to work not only at the local community level, but also at uh, the uh, macro uh, national level, as well as a level one in between, you're at the meso or institutional level. So we're working in terms of institutional level, and, uh, and it's something we really, I am particularly extremely proud with this gender uh, policies that we were, um, that, that we managed to develop. Uh, now, as you know, as any other policy development process, uh, an, an, an institution of higher learning or any organization is a, is a process that is very, very political, highly political. So, um, but um, we were successful at developing uh, five different policies dealing with gender. Um, and we did that because our uh, charge is to work with disadvantaged or underrepresented populations. So we began by identifying who these uh, underserved uh, populations are in terms of the institution, in terms of the university. Uh, women, of course, but not. Uh, we learned that it wasn't just women in general, because as a matter of fact, there are more women in the College of Agricultural uh, Sciences than men, just like here in our College of Agricultural Sciences. I think it's, uh, Mary, you know how many, but there are more ladies, more females uh, than males. Uh, but we, uh, in, through our research or, or our baseline um, surveys, uh, we um, learned that there are particular groups of women, such as the rural women, uh, women who are single and who have uh, who are mothers, who have a family, um, indigenous population also. Uh, Paraguay has a high, I don't recall, but Sonia, I don't know if you recall what the, maybe I think it's 30 percent, If, but I'm not certain, about 30 percent of the population in Paraguay uh, is compromised by indigenous group. In fact, Guarani is uh, the most widely spoken indigenous language, but there are many others. And is Guarani is an official language with Spanish, it's the official languages of Paraguay. So five agenda policies targeting each of these underserved or underrepresented uh, groups of females and indigenous uh, uh, people. Uh, four deal with access and one deals with the retention because it's not um, I think sometimes these donors or funding agencies think that it's all about uh, access, but they don't think that it's the main thing is graduation. It's the retention and graduation of, of women. Then we have the, uh, it happens that FCA, the Faculty of agrarian sciences or agricultural sciences. They have a center for leadership, but it's more of a virtual center than anything else. Because it's, uh, right now, there's only one person at this center. So they are badly in need of, um, of uh, uh, development uh, efforts. Uh, so we are doing that. And um, by the way, the faculty, uh, sorry, the uh, College of Agricultural Sciences uh, is located not only in the main campus, but in five other places around the country. So there are five camp, uh, well, I should say four other countries. See? No, there's the center in five other places. So six different locations for the uh, College of Agrarian Sciences. Uh, so we, um, committed ourselves to developing a thinking for leadership in each of these six sites. The school 
know them. Sometimes uh, the main barrier for the young ladies to move from high school to an institution of higher learning, like it is also here, but even more uh, pronounced there, is uh, the, the economic situation of uh, their families. So we are developing a scholarship program to provide financial support to these uh, young ladies and indigenous uh, students, high school students. Uh, these are four other initiatives. How am I doing in time? Okay. Um, communication and digital media program. Uh, this has been a, um, a very successful program. And it just happened that one of the members of uh, the team who is in my department, Ricky Tell, is our local ex expert in communication and digital media program. And the, the, everyone there is so uh, thirsty to learn about technology, means of communication, using technology, uh, and everything that has to do with digital media. Um, it's usually one of the most uh, well attended uh, sessions, training sessions. Um, pre entry program, as uh, I mentioned, working in agricultural high schools. So, in order to create that, um, how do we call it here, a channel, or that, that way to uh, ensure that more females, more indigenous students graduate from those high schools. Not only graduate, but are prepared to, with the skills, with the competencies, prepared to pursuing uh, their studies at a university, establishing a what we call a pre-entry program. Okay. And the pre-entry program consists not only in the uh, reinforcement uh, or, or reinforcing uh, academic, um, the academic skills of the students, but also in providing emotional, uh, psychological uh, support, which is uh, a, a of great necessity, as we have uh, learned in, uh, in Paraguay with this particular underserved groups. A mentorship program. The mentorship program consists of three components. One is the peer mentors, uh, which is a very my, a bit of a foreign concept in Paraguay. Here we talk about peer mentorship programs, peer mentors, and it's something that you find, if not in all, most colleges and universities, not in Paraguay, not in other parts of the world, in other words, uh, including Paraguay. So, uh, but um, just recently we had uh, a, um, we identified and selected and appointed 25 students uh, from the school to serve as peer mentors. The second component of the mentorship program is uh, f faculty serving as mentors. And, and it's not that they're not mentoring their students, they are, but not in a, in a formal manner, not as, uh, in a, uh, as a system. So we're making sure that uh, the faculty provides mentorship in the areas of most needs. So we had to uh, also survey the students in order to identify what are the specific needs of the students and what disciplines and what areas. And the third uh, component of the mentorship program is uh, identifying and inviting professionals from outside the university, professionals from the private and the uh, public sector to serve as mentors. Um, of course, the recipients of these three different types of mentorship are females and indigenous students. Um, anyone who's not from the College of um, Agriculture and Life Sciences? All of you are from, okay. All right, I don't know if you, you know of extension, uh, agricultural extension services, uh, 4-H, have you heard? Okay, 4-H, everybody knows about 4-H. 4-H or uh, youth leadership development programs are part of what we do through extension. Uh, 
um, we work with communities. In Florida, we work with all 67, in all 67 counties uh, through this extension program. So we are in the um, uh, in uh, undertaking some uh, initiatives and in strengthening their extension uh, uh, programming. Other initiatives uh, deals with the internship program. Uh, Susana, here we go. This, the Center for Professional Development and Job, and job Placement. Um, uh, there is not any center like that beautiful center, center that we have here on campus. We call it the Career Resource Center, right? That is nationally recognized. Uh, well, we're trying to do uh, something based on that, um, on that model. Maybe one day we will come as prominent as the career, U.S. career resource center. But uh, this is a center where uh, we will house an internship program. So the coordinator of this center will, um, will uh, coordinate a program of internship. Uh, for that, of course, a, a great deal of, um, of uh, linkages need to be created with the private and public sector. Uh, an ambassador program, you are, I'm sure you're aware that the University of, Pro of Florida has an ambassador program, our college has an ambassador program. These are a selected number of group of students who go out there and uh, uh, the external stakeholders what UF is all about. So we are forming, it's not developed yet, but this is one of the initiatives to be uh, taking place during this year, the second year, uh, in which um, an ambassador program will be established. Okay. Well, this is it because I want to leave at least well, 10, 15 minutes for question and answers. So for I just to converse a bit about the project or this um, year. How has it been received um, by the students as of yet who have been um, part of some of the leadership programs that have been developed? Have you done kind of assessment to see how they feel about into their topics? Do they feel like it was? Uh, definitely missing or getting a lot from it, or okay. Actually, the course is because uh, it was just developed. Um, the first year, it was in the process of developing uh, the course with the input from all these different stakeholders, and in the process of uh, um, receiving approval from all these committees that approve your curriculum. Now we are in the second phase, which is the delivery of that course. And then soon, hopefully, we will know what the perception or what is the response of the students in terms of the course. Uh, students, some students are already familiar or uh, they know that, uh, the, that we, we call ourselves PIMP in, uh, in Paraguay, that we have gone through all this process. So they're also anxious to see what we have there to deliver <laughs> for them. So ask me that question in one year, please, Mary. And then my second question is, what, what initiatives are being done to improve retention of women in the higher education? The mentorship program plays, a, as you know, as you can understand, plays a major role. And again, that's why uh, we decided uh, for a uh, three-component mentorship program. So the student is uh, receive mentorship from a peer, from another student, uh, and because again, each of these mentors are in better pos position to deliver a specific type of mentorship. Uh, when it comes to faculties, mostly in terms of curriculum or in terms of the, uh, of, um, of the subject matter, uh, uh, professionals also, uh, they are better uh, at providing certain type of uh, mentorship, for example, leadership development for a as a professional. Uh, what uh, in terms of the skills that are 
uh, demanded or um, required to be a professional in different sectors. Uh, peer mentors sometimes are more helpful in terms of guiding the student, uh, in terms of um, socializing the student within the university and in the university uh, life. So, but it's not the only um, the only tool to um, uh, to retain uh, the students. But it's, right now, is what we have in place. I have a question about the mentorship program because I'm a big advocate for mentorship, yeah. especially for affecting um, minority students or underrepresented students. What we're talking about in this thing. Um, so, I guess my question was, how did you take the peer mentors? Like, who are the peer mentors? And to, like, did they go through any kind of training, you know, talking about race, ethnicity, and, like, all these issues, you know, mm -hmm. you know, how our society is not very much about talking indigenous populations, you know, there's no one else, you know, like, it's like, oh, we know about that. I've learned about that. <laughs> yes. Or class, or, you know, all these different issues that, because I, I believe in mentorship, but it's not the right way. It's of course. understanding what's, what is for and what are the issues that we need to address. Um, but if you're doing mentorship just as, I'll tell you, well, this building is, or, you know, what I did, and I'm not listening to your experience, then I, I don't think, you know, mentorship is going to have that. Yeah, you want to have an effective mentorship yeah, program. Effective mentor yeah, so I guess those, I, I don't know, so. Is my question clear? Sorry, sorry. No, it definitely is, Natalia. Okay. okay, so let me tell you a bit about how uh, we undertook this uh, initiative. Um, we uh, sent out a call uh, to invite, uh, oh, even before that, through training sessions. For example, a training session that was conducted by Grady and who else conducted and Susanne Smith, another faculty member in the team. Uh, we tried to identify students who uh, display uh, leadership uh, potential during this, uh, during training and workshop sessions, number one. And we made a, you know, we made a point to, um, to keep them in mind. Secondly, we sent out a, an invitation college-wide to uh, students uh, who, uh, particularly from the uh, third and fourth year, who wanted to, to volunteer to serve as mentors, peer mentors. Uh, then we, there was a committee, a selection committee was put in place um, that reviewed all the applications and selected uh, the uh, peer mentors. They had to go, they had to complete an application form in which they were asked um, uh, whether they were male or female, because do, we do want, again, emphasize uh, uh, the participation of females. Um, we also make a note of um, ensuring that there were students from each of the, of the five academic areas. Uh, we ask them, why do you want to be a peer mentor? Uh, and that get, provided a lot of insight into, again, their uh, the, the, the reasons why they wanted to be mentors. So a group of 25, I have say, was selected. Uh, then I think a few days after they were selected, they were invited to uh, participate in a half a day training workshop. It was leadership, but leadership emphasizing mentorship, how to be an effective mentor. Um, and what, you know, your responsibilities as, you, as mentor, uh, the responsibilities of a mentee, so on and so forth. We develop uh, uh, contracts uh, or between the mentor and the program and between mentors and mentees. Um, on, on, a, uh, every, on a regular basis, I believe it's three or four weeks, we have regular meetings with a group of mentors peer mentors, in, uh, in which uh, they have the opportunity to uh, convey any issues or any needs they may have 
in, in being uh, peer mentors, and they also receive further, uh, further training. Um, they are the coordinator of the mentor program uh, has an open two-way communication with all these uh, with this all these 25 uh, peer mentors so that's basically can you think of anything else Sonia that we have established by the way uh, Sonia Delphin is the, um, the coordinator of the program okay she is the program coordinator. We have another program coordinator, or in other words, uh, uh, someone like Sonia in Paraguay. Uh, we have a gender specialist, and we have the coordinator of the Center for Career Professional Development and, and what do we call them? Career, yeah, job placement. I don't know if I, uh, did I respond to your question, Natalia? Okay, so in the training, there were, in the, the, well, what was the nature of the training or subject? Yes. In terms of, uh, now, we don't expect the peer mentors to be psychologists or professional counselors. That's one thing. We have to keep in mind the uh, needs of the student because they are student peer mentors. They're busy students like all students. Uh, but in how to deal with uh, sensitive issues, yes. Mm -hmm. Any other question or comment? We have four more minutes, I think. I guess I do. What, and maybe in the previous slide, but I missed it. What are the outcomes of all this? Um, so in three years when the um, when funding stops, what do you um, Okay, so maybe before I answer that question, this is the, the best time to provide you with a handout that Sonia and I prepared, so thank you, Mary. So this helped me in my response to you. Okay. Um, these are some uh, major achievements. We need more copies major achievements of uh, the uh, program, okay? So at the end of the day, what do we, where do we expect to be or to have accomplished? Is, that's your question. In other words, in two years from now, the end of the three-year program. Well, uh, a number of things. Number one, to have increased the number of females from specific uh, uh, groups of specific population, indigenous uh, women from rural areas, so on and so forth, to have increased their representation in, uh, in terms of graduation. Well, but we will get there because, again, the donor, uh, sometimes they don't understand how long it takes to get a student through <laughs> the whole uh, academic program, but hopefully they will be on their way to uh, graduate and doing well because they're being supported by the mentorship program, uh, by this uh, center. Uh, they have hopefully um, uh, been in a, or concluded an internship uh, program. Uh, they, um, they have developed the leadership skills, the skills that professionals, that the external stakeholders are telling us that they're, they're the ones that they require or they're looking for. Not necessarily the ones that we think they need, no. Um, uh, we expect to have a system in place where uh, a good number of a uh, certain percentage of students from, from a number of agricultural high schools are moving on prepared uh, to the uh, to study any of the agricultural sciences at the university, uh, we um, expect to have sustainable means for the financial, the social, the academic, even the environmental uh, dimension of the program. It's not. It's that it's no longer. It's going to be the program or the IFAS program or the MARTA program or anything like that, but it's the FCA program. 
is the, is the is a, is a program of the people of Paraguay. I mean, that's a very short uh, sentence. And there's all these indicators and targets, and so far, so good, right? Members of the. Yes. Okay, last question because I've been trying to wrap it up. Um, do you think Paraguay is ready to see women um, to actually have access to the same rights that men do? Um, and if you do, do you think that the women in the economic sector is for all these jobs that you're preparing them to have? Is the country itself is not prepared? It's like in, in most places. Uh, in general, yes. This is the, the momentum. Of course, there are sectors, there are groups, there are other interests that uh, that do not, maybe they don't, may not understand yet, or may, uh, because of the lack of knowledge or understanding, they still um, they still reacting in a in in a negative manner, or uh, they justifying. Uh, all this in a different in a different manner, uh, but it's part of our our work. Um, but yeah, I, overall, in general, yes, I think it's really uh, we. Uh, I mean, we hear the voices of women in Latin America. I'm one of them. In our familia, we, we, women in Latin America, not women just like me, but women from all the sectors are voicing in terms of the needs, in terms of the dreams, in terms of the priorities. Yes. Thank you very much. My email is there if you have any questions or comments.